station. This is Isa Piao here in the Vatican. How can you hear me? That dot of light is not just a pretty star. Jules Isa Piao in the Vatican. This is space station. We hear you loud and clear. I can see in the sky things that are beautiful and familiar and have a history and smile at me and remind me that God makes good things. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This call to try to understand the universe is a divine call. That is the basis on which we have the courage to be scientists. Surrounded by the majestic papal gardens on the site of the Pope's former summer residence at Castel Gandolfo is a department of the Vatican that most people don't even know exists. For here, in this heavenly setting, the Vatican Observatory examines the heavens. Brother Guy Consolmagno is a former lecturer at Harvard and MIT. Now a Jesuit, he is the director of the Vatican Observatory. We've got 12 astronomers, most of them Jesuits, there are a couple of uh, diocesan priests who work with us. And we all have doctorates from different universities from around the world. We come from four continents. We do science ranging from you know, the Planck time of the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds before that time after the Big Bang to dust that hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere now and everything in between. And it's not just here at Castel Gandolfo. Across the Atlantic Ocean in Arizona in the United States, the Vatican purchased this state-of-the-art telescope, where priests and brothers with degrees in the sciences, math and engineering capture awe-inspiring images like these. Why does the Vatican have an astronomical observatory? Don't you think every major religion should support astronomy? The answer is deeper than that, of course. In 1891, Pope Leo XIII deliberately established a Vatican observatory. Astronomy was a field that the Vatican already had, a really strong international reputation. And this was to show the world that the church was not against science, and also to show the world that the Vatican was a nation with a national observatory. So it was part scientific and part political. As most of these things are. The thing that, you know, the reason we continue to have a Vatican Observatory is to continue to remind the peoples in the pew that we are not anti-science, that the church not only supports science, but the church is mother of science in many ways, because science began in the universities. In the observatory's headquarters, there is a museum documenting the Vatican's contribution to science and astronomy dating back as far as 1582 and the Gregorian reform of the calendar. This is the first telescope that the observatory got in 1891 and it was installed in a little dome on the Tower of the Winds. So this was back in Vatican City and in fact the first telescopes were on the walls of the Vatican City. We didn't move out here until the 1930s. The museum is a treasure trove of a part of Vatican history that is widely unknown, like the story of the Sisters of the Child Mary, who helped map and catalogue nearly half a million stars in the late 1800s. We developed a laboratory to measure the spectra of pure metals. The observatory also has one of the major collections of meteorites in the world, with over a thousand pieces from the depths of space. I get to have my hands on pieces of outer space, and that never stops being a thrill. So we're in the dome of the Schmidt telescope, which is actually just a giant photographic camera. And it was the final telescope installed here at the Vatican. It was put in here in the late 50s. And Pope Pius XII personally bought this telescope out of his family funds, not Vatican funds. Another incredible piece of history about this room, it is where Pope Paul VI spoke to the astronauts. The Apollo astronauts on the moon. Wow. He was standing, actually sitting, exactly right where you are. First, a blessing in Latin, and then a message to the astronauts in English, referring to uh, the moon as the, the pale goddess of our dreams. Wow. It was beautiful, it was poetic. Pope Paul VI 
is speaking to you, astronauts. Greetings and blessings to you, conquerors of the moon. And it was a moment that showed just how dedicated the church is to being in tune with the science and the technology of the times. And 240,000 miles from Earth, on board the Apollo spacecraft, the astronauts had brought a small flag of Vatican City. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Brother Guy is from Detroit, Michigan, and entered school in 1957, the same year the Russians launched the first satellite. You are unique. You're probably one of the only people in the world who is wearing a Roman collar and an MIT ring. So let's go back. You grew up in Michigan, in the United States of America. Were you always interested in science? I know you call yourself a Sputnik kid. I started kindergarten the year that Sputnik went up. 1957. And 1957. I was, uh, you know, going to grade school when someone would bring in a portable television, which is, you know, so bigger than I am now, so we could watch the launches of the Mercury and the Gemini capsules. How could you not be fascinated with science? I grew up in a time when anything was possible. Very fine grain as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. But I was also fascinated with my religion, not just a part of my religion, but fascinated by it, you know, in the sense, in the nerdly sense of the, the, the nuts and bolts, how does this work? Because the deep thing is, you're not gonna prove God with science. God is bigger than science. God can't be proved by science. God proves that science works, not the other way around. But you must come up against that all the time because I know there are so many people, there will be so many people watching this who will think religion has no business in science and vice versa. The two are completely different. With science, you need proof, you need hard evidence. People put so much time and resources and effort into proving the things that we cannot see. On the other hand, with religion... It's all blind faith. It's they blind. You need faith. There's no proof. There's no hard evidence. And right. it will probably always be that way. So how can you marry the two? Take a look at your cell phone. Take a look at the charger on your cell phone. There are two very important numbers on that charger. The number of amps it's putting out, the number of volts it's taking in. Do you know who Ampere was? He was a devout and active Catholic in 19th century France. Do you know who Volta was? 18th century Italian, devout Catholic. If you're going into medicine, uh, Mendelian genetics, do you know who Mendel was? He was an Augustinian priest. If you're going into any kind of engineering that involves electronics, you're going to be using Maxwell's equations. Do you know who Maxwell was? A very devout Anglican. So the evidence in front of you is that anybody tells you you have to give up your science to be a religious person or your religion to be a scientific person is giving you a load of nonsense. And then you should ask yourself, why are they telling you that? What's in it for them? The big B. <laughs> the, <laughs> Book of Genesis versus the Big Bang Theory. Right. There's a perfect example of how the two are so opposed, there could never be any point in the middle where they could meet. <laughs> how can you be a man oh of both? I'll start off by reminding you that the Big Bang Theory was devised by a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre, and it was opposed by a lot of astronomers in his day because they thought it was too close to the idea of creation. But Genesis is not a book of science. Genesis is a book about God. And everything it says about God is not only still true, but now that we know more about how the universe is created, it's even more important and more true than the poor guy who wrote Genesis could ever have believed. And do you believe written in a poetic way deliberately in order to make it timeless? It had to be written in a poetic way because the science keeps changing. You know, God couldn't say, and then I had a big bang because a hundred years ago, people would have said, what were you talking about? And a thousand years from now, the big bang is going to look, you know, kind of naive, I hope. It has to be spoken in poetry. What do you think are the advantages of being a scientist who has faith? The biggest advantage is it keeps you centered on why you're doing this. Science should be for the glory of God. And what I mean is it should be fun because joy is the glory of God. Joy is evidence of God's presence. 
And joy only comes when you approach the truth. How has your scientific work over the decades changed your faith? My scientific work has made me recognize the joy that comes from being close to God. My scientific work has made me recognize the necessity of church. I can't just find God on my own. Brother Guy Consolmagno's list of achievements and accolades is too long to mention, and his work as a Vatican astronomer has brought him close to three popes, like Pope John Paul II, a young brother guy on the right, pictured with the saint in 1995, and Pope Benedict, who was filled with questions about meteorites, and of course, Pope Francis, who continues to support the work of the observatory today. But for brother Guy, what really makes his work special is something deeper and more personal. My father lived to be 100, my mom to 97. Um, both of them were tremendous role models to me. Uh, I was very close to my father in so many ways. He wanted to be an astronomer, but you know, in, in the depression, that wasn't gonna happen. Would he look at the stars at night with you? My father knew the stars. Um, he had learned them as a kid, and then he was a navigator with the Army Air Corps during World War II. So the stars were both a source of pleasure, but also a very important part of very deadly business. Do you think about him now when you peer through the telescopes? Sometimes? All the time. All the time I think of him. And there's not a week goes by when there isn't something that I want to tell him about. Something that I know he'd be really, you know, delighted to hear about. What did he think of the work you were doing? I hope he was proud, not that I was at the Vatican or knew the popes or whatever, he enjoyed that, but just that I was able to do the astronomy that he'd always wanted to do. The Vatican Observatory is looking to the future and gives talks to encourage kids all over the world. And they also run an annual summer school here at the observatory for students of astronomy from every continent and from all backgrounds, many of whom have gone on to work for NASA and space agencies all over the world. You may have heard about that image of the black hole that came out a few years ago, the yeah, shadow of the black hole. The fellow who organized that, ran it, put it together, was a summer school student of ours in 1993. The observatory has also launched a new website and podcast, showing the world the strong ties between religion and science. It's amazing that you've been doing this for almost five decades, but you still have such enthusiasm and passion for it. It hasn't faded. If you ever lose the passion for what you're doing, then you've lost the reason to do it. But in astronomy, it's easy. Just go outside at night and look up.